scholarship last year. Sorry. And has worked in a grant project in Berkeley as well. He's bringing up a close. He's bringing us a close-up look at bees, both the European honeybee and many less well-known bees and other pollinators. Let's welcome Taylor Rain. Taylor. Got it. Yeah. Wonderful. And could everybody mm. please mute themselves during Taylor's um, mm. presentation? And then if you have questions, mm. you can ask him later. Okay. Beautiful. Well, thank you all for having me today. I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to present to a group of, of community members who really care about uh, gardens, flowers, and plants. Um, and I want to make sure that there are opportunities for you to contribute during my, my presentation because uh, we see learning as a dynamic process. Um, it's not something meant to be um, shared by one individual for the benefit of many, but many voices are important for us to move uh, towards a more sustainable and hopefully environmentally sound future. So as Landry said, I am uh, Taylor. I'm from UC Berkeley. And um, I've helped to make our campus um, recognize the importance of bees for our environment. We've helped in um, the city of Berkeley with the Berkeley Parks Department and a, a nonprofit called Transition Berkeley to um, plant some pollinator gardens. But there's a lot um, that I'd like to cover today. And my first question for you is, if you only had one choice of food to eat for your entire life, um, what would it be? Um, and this is just a self-reflection question. Um, if you'd like to put some answers to this question in the chat, um, Color. you can certainly do so. And I will take a look at those as we go through the presentation today. But the reason, oops, the reason being is that so much of what we have done in traditional uh, land management practices and agriculture has converted diverse environments to monocultures, to very limited habitat. And in some cases, our wildlife and our bees may be only able to forage upon one kind of flower or plant. So just imagine, if you only had one thing to eat your entire life, what would you want it to be? But some of the objectives for today I'd like to share with you the importance of bees in agriculture. We're going to explore the European honeybee and five native bee groups of California. Um, and we're going to identify ways for you to contribute to pollinator conservation. Uh, I want to offer you some volunteer opportunities and ways that you can help in Berkeley. Uh, and hopefully that'll inspire you to make some changes in your own yard or garden or uh, get involved with me and our, our bee campus team. All right. Well, let's get started. Um, so bees are, are an incredible group of organisms and it's a great place to start with what is a bee. Um, and there's certainly some scientific um, uh, definitions of what a bee is. And uh, first thing is, is that they're, they're an insect that has the ability to collect uh, nectar and pollen from flowers. It consists of three parts with a head the thorax and the abdomen. Um, and they have all these different features here, uh, like hair. Uh, but in real practice, I'm sure that you, you, you folks are not really going to be considering what those little minute details are. But we want to know what kind of differentiate bees from flies. Um, and there are some cool common practice um, techniques that you can see if you're looking at a flower or a plant in the yard or garden, um, bees that you see on flowers, they typically have their wings folded into their body. So that's a great little visual feature to look at. Flies, however, their wings are located at kind of an angle. So if you compare this photo to the one on the left, uh, you can see that this one has wings folded near its, near its abdomen, and this one has kind of a V shape. So that's, a, that's sometimes a good determining characteristic. Bees also have two sets of wings. So it's a double, double. Flies only have one, one wing on each side of its body. The eyes are somewhat different of a bee and a fly. Bees have um, 
eyes locate on the side of their body. And um, on flies are generally more frontally oriented. Um, there are some other features like the antennae that we could look at too, but bees are, are somewhat related to flies, but they're more important in our conversation today because um, bees have gained so, so much recognition in the past. Um, and also just, just let me know if there are any questions by using the, um, the raise hand feature, which I think would be in some of your um, options. Might be, not sure. But let's start with asking how many bees are there in California and the US? And it's fascinating because California is home to almost 1600 species of different bees. The Urban Bee Lab at uh, UC Berkeley has conducted so many urban bee surveys um, that has documented perhaps we can find 80 or so um, species of, of native bees in our California gardens in Berkeley. Um, so just a rough proportion, if there are about 4,000 species of bees across the U.S. and 100 are in California, California has a rough estimate of 40 percent of all the bees in North America. And so we're home to an incredible diversity of insects. And these, just two of them out here, um, are some that you may see in your yard or garden. But there are so many other obscure, sometimes um, more discreet pollinators that we might see. And these are things like digger bees, in the upper left, and the genus Hapropoda. Hapropoda is a um, popular genus of digger bees in Berkeley. And we have on the lower left, the blue orchard mason bee, Osmia linaria. And in the upper right, um, a green sweat bee, which I particularly like its color. Um, and I think it's very recognizable to some folks that may have cosmos or other flowers in the genus uh, or in the family Asteraceae, which are the asters, sunflowers, other flowers that have that distinct kind of sunflower shape. But why is it that bees are so important and other pollinators? Well, we depend upon them for the pollination of almost two thirds of the world's crops and 90% of flowering plants. Um, these are things like squash, blueberries, and uh, many of the fruits and vegetables you may have eaten today. Yeah, I see, a, I see a question out there or a raised hand from Bonnie. I have a, a lot of ceanothus, a lot of ceanothus. And so I have a lot of bees whenever the sun is out. Is there one particular species that's likely to be on ceanothus or not? Yes, you've, you've brought upon a, a great point. So some species of native bees um, have a preference for the flowers that they visit. Ceanothus, for instance, attracts a number of kind of bumblebees, bombus, um, and may, they, they're typically there to collect pollen and nectar uh, from that flower. Uh, but other kinds of species of native bees like uh, uh, digger bees may also be common on those plants, but particularly it's the bumblebees that we can uh, observe on ceanothus. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, another good question I have is, um, can you guys put in the chat some of the kinds of fruits or vegetables you think uh, would be pollinated by bees? Or you can raise your hand and offer a, a, a suggestion. And while, I, while we await some uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, I'll describe how I place this uh, glass of milk on the screen. And that is because um, pollinators indirectly contribute to our dairy products because a particular species of introduced bee called the alfalfa leaf cutting bee helps to pollinate alfalfa plants, which we feed cattle, sheep, and goats. So if we expanded 
our consideration of how bees help contribute to our food system. Right now, the estimate of economic value is about $20 billion per year for the US in the economic value provided by bees. We haven't included the figure of all the indirect value generated by um, our dairy products. So that figure could be expanded even greater. And even things like, yeah, we're seeing some uh, great, great examples in the chat, tomatoes, apples, citrus, everything, strawberries, yeah. Even coffee beans and chocolate are, are pollinated by tropical species of insects. Coffee beans, um, I've heard are pollinated by, uh, or coffee flowers are pollinated by tropical honeybees. And the cacao uh, plant is pollinated by midges or a tropical species of fly. And just as a visualization for why or how uh, pollinators can really facilitate um, pollination, it's really great for me to, to be able to present this side-by-side uh, -side imagery of how um, strawberries compare in different situations. In a situation of poor pollination, the fruit quality is lower and smaller. If it's well pollinated, the fruit is much plumper and rich, um, pest damage even worse. Um, and this is actually the time I'll have uh, Martha get the poll ready because um, strawberries are an unusual kind of flower and I don't often take the time to look at them, but I wanted to ask you all, which kinds of pollinators do you think, or which organisms do you think are the most popular kinds of native pollinators to strawberry flowers? Um, and I'll, I'll uh, give you guys a, a few minutes to um, put in your idea. This is multiple choice. If you have strawberry plants in your yard or garden, or if you don't, um, you can imagine what kinds of pollinators might be possible or might be popular for those, those flowers. Do we only have one choice or, or can we have more than one? You can have more than one. And while while we're waiting, Matt, can I say what is what is poor pollination as opposed to good pollination? Oh, well, in this scenario, it was just meaning that it was either done by wind or there was no access to insects. Um, and the fundamental role that bees play is that they help transfer pollen from one flower to another. And in some species of flowers and very um, different you know, kinds of plants. There may be flowers that only produce the male part of the plant, like the stamen with the pollen. And then there may be other flowers that only contain the female parts of the flower. Uh, and in that situation, bees are really essential for helping transfer pollen from the male flower to the female flower. Um, in the case of strawberries, that's not the case. So they can, they can produce fruit and set fruit without the presence of bees, but it's often much lower quality and the facilitation of genetic diversity and variation facilitated by bees really aids in the um, production of that, that fruit and its quality for our consumption. All right, what's our poll response? Are you able to see all the answers, Taylor, or do I need to tell you that? No, maybe maybe you can uh, try to try to display our, our response. I don't know how to display it. Okay. Uh, if I end the poll, will it display? Let's see. Yeah. Oh, share results. It says. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, we got some responses here. So, biggest one was the honeybee and butterflies. And now um, the, can you, can you all see these answers too? So 
Um, one, one little caveat I put was popular native pollinators. So we're, we're going to talk about how the European honeybee uh, is actually from uh, Europe and that it was in, introduced in the age of our settlement of the New World. But yes, honeybees can be found on strawberry plants, so that, that is good. And some species of butterflies, like the fiery skipper, uh, could be observed on those plants. But in fact, some of the most popular visitors are species of mining bees and seraphid flies. Um, and these, of course, are more obscure to the average observer, but they may be the more effective um, kinds of bees or other kinds of uh, visiting insects that visit the strawberry flowers. So I'm glad you guys participated in that and we're gonna continue to explore um, other kinds of pollinators. So the real fundamental thing that I wanna drive home is that pollination is one of the four, falls under one of the four ecosystem services that um, we typically learn about in our environmental science courses or biology and other kinds of science classes. But in, in the environment, an ecosystem service is anything that nature provides for humans and for our uh, healthy um, ecosystem that has some value. And there are four major classes of ecosystem services. Um, provisioning services, such as in the form of raw materials like timber, linen, metals, anything that's raw materials that we can find. Yeah, Bonnie, I see you, you have a hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what a mining, a mining bee is. That was the last slide. What, what is a mining bee? That was the poll. It was mentioned in the poll. Yes. We're going to get to the, the, dis, the discussion of mining bees, but those are a species of native bee um, found in California that are really, really small um, and that nest underground. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see some images of those, and hopefully you'll be able to use that um, to find them in your own yard. Okay, so we have provisioning services like the raw materials, support services which are long uh, processes like soil formation, nutrient cycles, the cultural services we obtain from recreation like boating, um, going on a ski lift or, or a ski. Um, down a, a slope, uh, snowy mountain, or even the spiritual value of nature. Um, and finally, we have regulating services. Pollination falls under this fourth category um, it, for the purpose that it provides in our food supply and the perpetuation of flowering plants. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, I may skip over a little bit of this because it does get into in the depth of how bees evolved. But just keep in mind that the, the first flowering plants in our uh, environment, in the first you know, evolutionary um, emergence of flowering plants co-evolved with bees and other insects. And so that's why there's this fundamental relationship between um, honeybees, bumblebees, flies, um, and other kinds of, of pollinators with some of the first flowering angiosperms around 100 million years ago. Um, so they're responsible in that way for um, helping facilitate the sexual reproduction of plants. And bees um, and other insects benefit from flowers through the collection of nectar and pollen. And that's where that we have that interdependent relationship. The first historical evidence of beekeeping could trace back to about 9,000 years ago, um, all the way back into a region called Turkey um, today. So, but we're gonna skip ahead to the more recent evidence of beekeeping or the more recent advents. And most of you are familiar today with uh, the, the typical wooden boxes that we see uh, putting honeybees in. And this was a development of um, an individual named Lorenzo Langstroth. And he founded um, the design of a Langstroth hive back in 1851. Um, this was an improvement upon 
An earlier design made by Thomas Wildman, another Englishman, uh, in 1770. But we started from making um, bees or bee houses uh, for honeybees out of these uh, woven skeps. And they were typically pretty disposable and very uh, fragile. So unfortunately, when it came time to harvest honey, it came at the expense and the demise of the honeybee colony. So thankfully, with the removable hive frames, uh, we're more easily able to examine and harvest honey from uh, these kinds of hives. Now, here's a great question. The term bee space was coined by Lorenzo Langstroth, and this is three eighths of an inch. Now, do some of you happen to be beekeepers on this call or anybody here know what is the importance of bee space? No guess or no uh, potential theories? Okay, well, the B space is the perfect distance between the frames and the, the corridors of the um, Langstroth hive so that the honeybees don't build comb. If the space is too big, for them to walk through, they will begin to construct beeswax in that space to store you know, their food and raise brood. If the space is too small, less than three eighths of an inch, the honeybee worker begins to fill that void with propolis, which is a mixture of resin and wax to seal that cavity. But three eighths of an inch is just the right distance for honeybees to walk through freely. And they don't need to build comb or filled with propolis. So just think of bee space as the right distance of a hallway that the honeybee can walk through. And that is so powerful that we've used today. Um, let's see. And of course, honeybees are one of the most iconic uh, species of bees we've heard about. But they, they were imported from Europe. Um, and many of you may be familiar with that, that these are, you, are, are a social insect in which they build large colonies of several thousand individuals. Um, and they are composed of a very distinct caste system. We have a queen, a worker, and a drone. The queen is the sole reproductive individual. She lays the eggs and is controlling the uh, reproductive success of the colony. There may be 20 to 40,000 workers, worker bees in a colony, and they live uh, for only a few weeks in the summertime. But their job is to collect the food, uh, pollen, nectar, and help build a hive with beeswax and fill voids with propolis. Uh, and they also help raise the brood by uh, feeding them a mixture of bee bread. Drones are uh, re only used for the reproduction of uh, and mating purposes with queens from other colonies. And they typically serve very little purpose in a honeybee colony besides for mating. Any questions? And Something that may be rather new is actually thinking about how bees communicate. And something that we haven't developed yet or that we do not have the capacity to develop is chemical communication. And within a species of insects, there are very elaborate chemical communication um, pathways through what are called pheromones. These are intraspecific within a species chemical signaling compounds that basically generate a particular response if an insect perceives this chemical. And in a honeybee colony, we have four major classes of chemical pheromones. These are alarm pheromones, queen pheromone, brood pheromone, and nasinov pheromone. And each one of these is a distinct mixture of chemical components that the bees can distinguish from one another and can actually use that to um, generate a specific communicated response. Uh, Nasanov pheromone 
is actually used to help scent the hive and water sources. Alarm pheromones are used to signal the presence of an intruder or an attack. And the queen pheromone is used to reproduce or used to suppress the reproductive capacity of other workers in the colony. So as you see, they each have a specific function. And instead of using their sight or sound as much um, as we do, it's chemicals that really direct the activities and the um, coordination of a eusocial insect. And a beautiful frame of honey. <laughs> we cannot talk about honeybees without uh, first looking at how honey is made. Um, and the honey ripening process is extraordinary because it begins with the drop of nectar from a flower. And this drop of nectar may be perhaps 80% water content and 20% sugar. But through the process of dehydration at the hive, where honeybees fan their wings to, um, to evaporate the water from that nectar, they're able to convert it into a much higher concentration of sugar um, so that it becomes roughly 20% water and 80% sugar. And a final note is that uh, honeybees add what's called an enzyme called invertase from their honey stomachs to give the honey its distinct flavor um, and its uh, uh, ripening process is, is enhanced through the addition of invertase. Um, and these are some slides left over from our class session, but we actually do a comparison of some of the typical kinds of products we might find at the store and compare that in price per fluid ounce to the price of honey. Um, one thing we found was honey is about 75 cents per ounce, while olive oil from California is about 40 cents per ounce, and hydrogen peroxide, 50 cents per ounce. So out of all these three, three these, uh, other compounds, apple juice, hydrogen peroxide, and olive oil, honey is the most expensive for good reason, because it, it is a tremendous- uh, Hot dog, huh? oh. And El Cerrito is not. And um, it seems that and I'm very annoyed with them uh, because I was taken- uh, Yes, I thought I heard something, but- um, I think we will transition to talking more about common native bee groups of California, but we have a special guest here today um, from the Entomology Museum, and um, I'd like to see if we can maybe take um, some time to explore with him some of the uh, wonderful specimens he has to offer from uh, the collections. and. I think he's here on the call, so I'll let him uh, do a little more intro. And if possible, could we allow a screen share for um, for Pete, if possible, there? And then I will stop my screen share momentarily, and we will try to do. Uh, let's try that. Yeah. Folks, yeah, can can folks hear me out there? Yeah, Pete. Great. Uh, so I am here in the Essig Museum of Entomology. Uh, this is the insect research collection at the University of California here in Berkeley. And some of you may have even come to some of our events. We have a few events each year. Normally, we're not open to the public because it's a research collection. and There's really not much to see. Everything's put away in the cabinets behind me. Um, but in a few weeks on, uh, we're having homecoming weekend here on campus, the weekend of October 1st. So that Friday and Saturday, we're going to have an open house here at the museum. So it's one of the three chances during the year that you can actually come in and, and see the, the collection and some of our specimens. So Friday afternoon on October 1st and Saturday afternoon on October 2nd, uh, it'll be an open house and you can come down and see the collection. Uh, and I'll, I'll put a link to that in the chat after we're done here. So um, I've been working quite a bit with, with Taylor doing some of this work on campus to try to promote pollinators and get more native gardens and native plants on campus. And so he asked me to uh, 
to say a few words and uh, show you some things underneath the microscope. So right next to me here, I have a digital microscope that's connected to the computer. So I can put things underneath the microscope for you to, to look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if I can. And there we go. And you're looking at my email. You don't need to see my email. There we go. <laughs> so are you able to see some critters? Yep, All right. looks good. So I call these the three amigos. Um, here we have a honeybee and a yellow jacket wasp. And what about this one up here? So this is actually a fly. It's, it's a perfectly harmless hoverfly or serpent fly. And so I like to put these together because these are often confused when people see these buzzing around and they move quickly. And so it's, you know, when these things are moving around, it's really hard to, to tell what's going on. The honeybee looks much different just because it's, it's so much fuzzier. And we'll, we'll come back to that. It's, it's more of a golden color rather than a, a bright yellow. But this yellow jacket right here, this is the Western yellow jacket. It's got the bright yellow and black, but so does this fly. And so it's really easy to confuse these when they're moving quickly around the flower. But one of the ways you might recognize it, they're called hover flies and you see them hovering in one place around the flowers. Whereas the, the, while the yellow jackets tend to just land on the plant and do what they're gonna do, then fly away. They usually don't just hover above, above the flower that way. Uh, but they're easily confused. And one of the big differences between flies and bees or the main difference is the number of wings. So if you look at this yellow jacket, we have you know, two pairs of wings. Uh, so there's the front wings here and there's the hind wing right there. And I'll even zoom in a little closer. Get that in focus. So you can see, you know, here's the, where the front wing attaches, here's where the, the hind wing attaches. And then if we look at the fly, let's get that in focus. It only has a pair of wings in the front and what happened with flies is their hind wing was reduced to this little gyroscopic organ that we call a, a halter. And if you watch flies in flight, they, they twirl around like a, like a little uh, gyroscope. They, they kind of spin around. They help the fly keep its balance. And when people have snipped those off the flies, they can't fly in a straight line. So it really helps them to maintain its, uh, their, their balance and their direction in flight. So that's what makes a fly a fly. Its hind wings have been turned into these tiny little gyroscopes called halteres, whereas the bees and wasps all have two pairs of wings. So I thought that would be a fun one to start with. Another thing too uh, that you, you probably know already and was, was talked about a little bit is, you know, what, so what makes a bee a bee rather than a wasp? How, do, how are these things different in terms of their evolutionary background? Well, if we look at the hairs on this, this wasp, again, we'll zoom in, back up a little here, get that in focus. You can see that these hairs are very fine individual hairs. They're not branched at all. They're very fine single hairs. Get a few more of the head right here. So you can see each hair is, is very individual, very fine. Now, if I move over to the honeybee, what we can see is they've kind of got split ends. I think they need to get a better shampoo or something. Uh, but especially these ones here on the body that I'm putting in the middle, you can kind of see how they're, they're kind of frayed. They have these little, um, yeah, there lots of little pieces that come off of the main shaft of the hair. And that's what makes a bee a bee. So the group of insects that broke off from the rest of them that we call bees. They all have this in common. They have these hairs that are branched. And those hairs are really good at catching pollen. So those fine hairs that don't have the branches don't catch pollen quite as well. And you can see that this bee is just covered in pollen. So all that, those little yellow pollen balls are just stuck to this honeybee. And so that's what makes bees so effective at, at collecting pollen. And, and you know, we think about bees as pollinators but that's not why they visit flowers. The bees don't get up in the morning and say, okay, it's time to go pollinate those almonds. It's time to go pollinate those tomatoes. They don't care about pollination. They're there to collect food for themselves to feed to their larvae, to their offspring. So they have these special mechanisms that allow pollen to stick to them 
then they comb up that pollen. And then they, uh, in the case of honeybees, they stick it to their, their hind legs. So honeybees and bumblebees have this little organ on their hind legs, this flattened area. Um, let me see if I can get a better focus of that. Oh, here we go. This is a little bit better back here. So here's a big pile of pollen and the light is not great on that, but this is a big ball of pollen that is collected. So they comb up that pollen and then they stick it to their hind leg and they carry it back to the hive that way. So you heard uh, Taylor talk about bee space, the size of these bees. Well, since we know that, we can make little doors that only the bee can fit through, but not the little pollen ball. And so as they walk through these little screens, it actually knocks the pollen ball off and we catch it in a little basket that we can sell it in the natural food stores. So that's how we get these little pollen balls because we know how big the bees are so if we make a hole that they can just barely squeeze through, that knocks the pollen ball off and we can collect those pollen balls. So just a little bit there about honeybees. And of course, the honeybee is not native to North America, as we just talked about. Uh, but we do have lots and lots of native bees, you know, around 1600 just here in California. So I wanted to show you a few examples of some of those bees in our collection. So first, I'm going to show you and on the smaller end, we talked a little about mining bees. So here's a honeybee. And here's one of these little andrenid bees. That's a pretty tiny bee. I mean, think about how big a, a honeybee is. This, this is a, a tiny bee. These are the smallest bees that we know about. And this is why it's important when you're planting your garden to not have all the same kind of flowers because different kinds of bees and, and butterflies uh, they, they like different kinds of flowers. Those ones with the really long corollas are great for things like hummingbirds, but also butterflies so they can stick their, their long proboscis, their tongue deep into that corolla, and it's hard for other insects to get to that. And if all your flowers are big, then all the big insects, the bumblebees, the honeybees will get in there, but you need some of those tiny flowers as well to help support things like this, this little uh, andrenid bee, this little miner. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more on that and prove to you it really is a bee. Let's see. Rotate that a little bit. I'm going to zoom in, zoom in, focus. So it's got the four wings. You can see all four wings there. You can see those hairs. And so those are the hairs that it catches pollen with. So these are tiny, tiny little bees. And so it's, and so we have a very different way of mounting it. You can see there's a tiny little needle that goes through that bee, and then that, that little needle is mounted to a bigger one, a pin. So yeah, that's a little contrast in, in the size of some of these things. Um, sorry. I have a whole bunch of different things right behind me here. So kind of on the other extreme are things like the bumblebees. So again, those branched hairs, and you can see all that pollen is just all stuck in there and stuck in those hairs. And then again, they'll comb that pollen off. Just look how dense that is. That makes them really, really good at, at picking up pollen with their body. So they're just walking around through the flowers. They're, you know, they're not picking those pollen grains out one at a time. So they don't visit the flowers and say, oh, there's a nice pollen grain. There's a nice pollen grain. They're just walking around and, and getting it all caught in their hair. And then they'll they'll comb it off of them using their front legs and and they'll some of them will put it in their mouth and carry it that way. Others make a little pollen ball like the honeybees and stick it to their leg. And then other kinds of bees, like uh, leaf cutter bees, they capture the pollen on their underside of their abdomen. So here's this nice little leaf cutter bee, and you can see on the underside of the belly, it's got a bunch of hairs there and that's where it collects the pollen. So if we zoom in on that, we can see there's a whole bunch of pollen caught in there as well. So these kind of bees, if you have uh, things in the daisy family, the composites, like the seaside daisy and, and sunflowers and things like that, you'll often see them walking around on top of those flowers and then kind of wiggling their butt. And the, the wiggling of the butt is them rubbing those uh, hairs on the underside of their belly across all that pollen that's on the top of those flowers. And then it collects all that pollen right there on its belly. And that's how it carries its pollen around. 
And then rather than living in big hives like honeybees do and bumblebees do, most of our native bees, if you know, 99% of them are solitary. They don't go back to a hive. They lay a single egg. They provision that egg with nectar and honey and uh, with the, the, ne the honey and uh, pollen. And then they seal it off and they leave it alone. So they don't take care of the offspring like the honeybees do, like the bumblebees do. They just lay that egg, they leave food for the baby and just go away. And uh, so they, they, when they hatch, they have just enough food to make it through to the pupil stage. Then they emerge as adults and they do the same thing. A um, couple of other bees I'll show you real quick here from our collection. We talked about some of these shiny polyctid bees, the sweat bees. Um, yeah, and so oftentimes the males and females are different. The females tend to be all green and the males might be, uh, might have the yellow and black abdomens. You, you've probably seen some of these around your yards as well. So again, all of these bees, uh, they specialize in different sorts of, of flowers and having a greater diversity of flower types. So different families of plants is really critical if you wanna support a broad diversity of bees. So, you know, we, we all like certain kinds of flowers and some of them grow better than others. But if you had all daisy type flowers, um, you're, you're missing out on a whole bunch of different kinds of bees and what they like to, to feed on. Uh, just a couple other examples within this box. Let's see what I have here. And so other things that you, know, you might not think of as a bee, you see that and you might think wasp. But again, you know, there's quite a bit of diversity of, of different kinds of bees. So this is a bee as well. And again, you know, seeing all that pollen stuck to it is, is kind of the dead giveaway. So it has those branched hairs that are really good at, at capturing, capturing pollen. So I'll, I'll pause there for the moment and um, see if there's what's going on in the chat here. And uh, if anybody has any questions or things that they you know, like to know in particular, you can let me know now. You can either unmute or you can throw it in the chat. And Taylor, if there's anything else in particular that you wanted me to, to show, you can let me know. Um, so if you are interested in, in seeing more of, of the museum and what we do here, uh, again, you don't need to see my email, you can, uh, but you can go to our, our website, which is just essig.berkeley.edu. And our next event, um, got too many things here. Under events, we have homecoming coming up. And so that's, uh, that's coming up on the weekend of October 1st. So I'm gonna copy that and pop it into the chat. Where did you go chat? I'll find that again and pop it in there in just a second. And maybe um, while we're, while we're um, on this note, does anybody from the, the room want to want Pete to answer any questions about bees or insects? Because he, he is a, a, you know, studied these for a very long time. Or if you had a question about one of the specimens he showed you, uh, with that. I have a question about this. Uh, we have a, I knew this already, that we have a lot of these underground bees. And in my garden, much of the ground gets desiccated this time of year. I, I only, to save water, I only water plants and the rest of the stuff is wildflowers and nasturtiums and all these things that come up and go away. And I let the ground be hard as a rock. I mean, it's so dry right now. Does that wipe out the bees? No, they actually start their, their nest much earlier in the season. So, uh... You know, especially the bees that are out now, they were larvae earlier in the season. So back in the spring when the ground was softer is, is when, um, you know, they first emerged. But they're, they're pretty capable. When you're our size and you're trying to use your hand to grab some really dry dirt, it's not very easy. It's this really hard, clumpy stuff. But when you're their size and you're kind of moving one little grain of sand at a time, it's a little easier for them to, to move that ground around. But it is, you know, it is nice for them if it is a little softer. Um, however, of course, you don't want to drown them by flooding their, their colonies. But then you made me think of something else as well in that, you know, for because of the drought and because we want to be really conscientious about our water usage, we do a lot of mulching. And, you know, we, we see mulching as this great thing for our gardens. 
but you're also blocking the bees from yeah, getting yeah. into the ground and making their ground nests. So you do want to leave some areas free from mulch, some bare ground areas, and some bees like more sandy areas, some like more uh, clay areas, some like uh, serpentine soils. They like a, a great diversity of soil types and each one has its own. They like banks you know, rather than going you know, into flat ground. Some of them like to go into the edge of banks. So creating a little topography and having you know, different kinds of soil areas around and not putting mulch over everything uh, is really important to give them some, some nesting uh, space because most of our native bees either nest in twigs, so in hollowed out pieces of twigs, or they, they nest in the ground. And so some people uh, will put out the bee, the bee boxes where you drill holes or you have the straws and they, and the, they can lay their eggs in there. Um, but also just having some dead trees around where naturally there's holes from bark beetles and other things, so they'll, they'll nest in there. But uh, having them in the ground as well is important. And I see that Bonnie has her hand. I don't know if you already asked your question or, or if you still have that. I'm not great at using Zoom myself. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was a beekeeper and we enjoyed delicious honey every year. This was in the 1930s and 40s. Yeah, and there's still, go ahead, yeah. Oh, sorry, Peter. Um, I, I, I do have a question about the little bee houses. Right. Where, you know, it's, in my case, it's a sort of a log and it's got a bunch of little holes. And I've read conflicting information about uh, whether those should not be used for more than one year because they need to be cleaned out in some way. And I'm just wondering, if they can be cleaned out instead of thrown away, or or if it somehow is spreading disease to the little bees that go in there. Yeah, that's a great question, and um, I don't think there's necessarily conflicting information out there. There's just not a lot of information that makes it clear. And uh, it is true that if they keep reusing the the same straws that don't get cleaned out, or the same tubes that um, parasites could build up there. Um, but also just kind of opening them space to, to, to build a fresh nest, to have fresh material and not have a lot of old rotted material. Of course, out in nature, there's nobody cleaning out these tree holes and things like that. So obviously they're able to adapt to that, that sort of thing. And they do some cleaning themselves, some housekeeping. But especially if you're using little cardboard straws, and they even sell these for, for the bees. You know, they're, they're cheap, they're biodegradable. And, you know, if, if you don't want to go through the hassle of running a pipe cleaner through and cleaning those out, you can, you can, substitute some nice clean ones. But yeah, you do want to clean those out or replace them once in a while, just so we don't get a buildup of parasites and diseases. Well, how would you know when a good time of year to do that mm. without hurting anybody inside? <laughs> right, right. So, um, um, yeah, I don't think I have a great answer for that. So certainly, you know, not when there's larvae in there and how would you know that? So you need to see if they're still sealed, but once they, they break that, that barrier, so that each time, uh, especially with these uh, leaf cutter bees, they'll make a cell and then they'll seal that off. Whoops, Taylor's gonna show us something. <laughs> um, yeah, so they'll seal off one, one egg and then they'll put in another one and seal that off, put in another one to seal that off. So you should be able to see if, if there's, um, if they've been broken open or not. And if they're broken open, then you can go ahead and clean those out. Did you wanna show something there, Taylor? Yeah, this is just to, to compliment that these are the types of houses or um, blocks that um, Pete's talked about uh, that can attract mason bees and leaf cutting bees. Um, and so these are artificial uh, nesting blocks of specific diameter. And uh, as he said that the the bees will begin to make uh, nests near the back of the tube and successively partition each cell as she moves forward with mud. Um, then this is a very different nesting strategy from the honeybee, but um, near the front, if you see that it's been covered with mud, that's an indicator that that tube has been occupied and that you may want to leave it for um, the bees to emerge in the early spring. And although we do want to, uh, you know, so those are all uniform size, so they're good for a particular species of bee. 
but there's there's leaf cutters of various sizes and so you know you you can put different size holes out there it doesn't have to be this fancy these are kind of nice attractive things to have out there and a nice uh point of discussion when your friends say what's what's that you got in your backyard you know it's kind of a fun little discussion point but you can just put a log out there or a block of wood and drill some different size holes in it and hopefully they'll find it and if they don't find it right away don't be discouraged they'll find it eventually kind of the the one the most fun i've had with the leaf cutter bees is when i put a garden in my front yard i pulled up my lawn and put a native garden out and unfortunately that was also where my dogs like to wrestle and so I needed to put something up to keep my dogs from destroying the garden so I just got some bamboo and I, I made just a little fence out of bamboo and the next thing I know I see these little flashes of green flying by and it was leaf cutter bees that had decided to set up their their houses inside the bamboo and they found little cracks in the bamboo and they were stuffing them full of leaves and making their their nest so they find it, you know, they, they just need that space. You know, the ground nesting ones just need to have some space to dig their holes and the, the twig nesting ones just need to have some holes to nest in, but they, if they're around, they will find it. Well, it's great to see all of you and uh, hopefully I'll see you for, for homecoming weekend and feel free to uh, either shoot me a message directly or through Taylor if you have any other questions. Great. Thank you, Pete. You bet. So um, Taylor is suggesting that we take a little bit of a break um, before he continues his um, uh, presentation. Um, and so uh, how about if, if we take maybe a, a four or five minute break and then Taylor has plenty more to tell us. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited to be um, talking about this today. And there's just so much that we can, we can do. There's so much that you all know. There's, there are things that I've learned from, from Pete Boisky, for instance. Um, and I just, so I really wish we have the opportunity to come back and maybe do something in person in the future. So um, that's my, my acknowledgement. So thank you all for being here, but our common native bee groups of California um, I think are very, very valuable to, to look at. And as, as we've already seen under the microscope, there were some of the bees that Pete pointed out, like the green sweat bee in the bottom right corner, the European honeybee on the left, um, the bumblebee in the middle. And each of these is, is unique in the kinds of flowers it visits, such as the, the discussion we had earlier about the ceanothus plants that attract um, species of bumblebees, typically. And there may be specialist bees, like the squash bee in the upper right that visits exclusively your zucchini, your squash, and watermelons. Um, and something I'd like to just give you guys as a framework that I've discussed in our class is that we like to situate ourselves in insects talking about um, a spectrum of social organization. And that just means that some insects are solitary at the far left end of the spectrum. And that just means that each female is responsible for constructing her own nest and raising her own brood. And at the other far end of the spectrum, we have eusocial, which means um, these are insects that form large colonies and ha have a developed caste system and cooperative brood care like the honeybee. So there are bees that lie somewhere in the middle and they may be qualified as aggregate nesters, partially eusocial. Um, and it's just because there's such a diversity of bees out there that it's hard to qualify them as exclusively solitary where each female is independently making her own nest and eusocial where they have large, well-developed colonies. The first group of bees we'll look at are the bumblebees. And we'll start to recognize, hopefully by their name, there are two different kinds of bumblebees very popular in our gardens that I'll have you guys take a look at. The Bombus vosnesenskii on the left is the yellow-faced bumblebee. And you might ask, okay, these pictures look almost identical. <laughs> in, in many ways they do, but this bee on the left, is often much larger 
And it's differentiated by this bumblebee on the right because of its sleek look and it has shorter hairs. Um, this is the yellow-faced bumblebee and over here on the right is uh, the black-tailed bumblebee. So this one on the right is visiting. Can somebody tell me actually what kind of flower this is um, in this right photo? If you want to raise your hand or put in the chat, anybody can try to try to guess what kind of flower is this bumblebee visiting? Yeah, I see it. Um, yeah, a couple, couple people got it, manzanitas. And that's very distinct. These bell-shaped pendulum-like flowers are easily accessible for bumblebees with a long proboscis. And can somebody else kind of recognize maybe a particular food crop or a bush that produces food for humans that also has very similar shaped flowers? This is a challenge one. Oh, Lisa's an expert, yeah, the blueberries, all right. So that's right, because uh, that, that typical shaped structure um, is only accessible by bees with a very long proboscis. You don't usually see honeybees visiting the manzanita or the, or the, the blueberry plant, or and you don't see very tiny bees accessing those flowers either. So that's a really remarkable example of how structure matches uh, different kinds of bees. And another common pollinator in California is the blue orchard mason bee. And we've constructed artificial nesting tubes and um, houses like these to help attract mason bees. But they're typically small, un unassuming, bluish in color, sometimes black, and about the third the size of a honeybee. Uh, and as Pete said, we can sometimes use these tubes and nest gene trays to attract them. And I'll offer some resources at the end of this to where you might be able to find some of these houses uh, for purchase if you wish to do so. But this is what it looks like inside. And I always love giving these really weird looking photos because Sometimes you, you just don't have success at your own house and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I looking at? Well, this is what it should look like if you do have mason bees. <laughs> and the instance, the, the key features here are, again, the female begins by laying eggs near the back of the tubes that will develop into females. She partitions each cell moving forward with a layer of mud until she reaches the front of that little, little uh, round cylinder tube at which she'll begin to lay eggs that develop into male bees. And this fascinating evolutionary adaptation could have a number of explanations. And my question for you is, hmm, I don't have a slide. But my question for you is, what are some potential theories? What are your thoughts? What, what do you think could explain? Why does the mason bee lay female bees near the back and male bees near the front of the tube? I'll put myself on mute. Yeah, we're seeing some answers. Um, maybe I could try to call on somebody. Uh, how about Carrie? Are you there? Oh, I you think you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, I don't actually know. I, those two answers sounded good to me. Yeah. About developmental speed or protection. <laughs> 
And I think both of them are equally valuable. So near the front of the tubes, you're exposed to the elements in rain, predation, parasitism. And the males are more expendable in that rate. So the females near the back of the tubes will be typically more well protected. And that's important because they're the ones responsible for raising the next generation. Then the other theory was that males develop more quickly. And that's true as well. It may be only a matter of a day or two, but the males near the front of the tubes are able to escape first and the females take the slightly longer time before they emerge. And these here are the cocoons of the mason bees. So whereas you see these little yellow things, these are the larvae. The big brown things are the cocoons or the um, pupa, as we would say. And we also looked at some mining bees, which is a different kind of bee group entirely. These are the extremely small, very indiscreet um, kinds of bees we might find on a variety of flowers from buckwheats to globigillias to um, asters, and they often reside underground in the soil. So having open bare patches like shown on the left of soil where there aren't um, a bunch of weeds and there aren't a bunch of plants or um, mulch can often be a really valuable source of nesting sites for bees. Uh, so that's important. But these dicker bees, these are in the genus Tapropoda, are much bigger. Um, and I love to, to show these photos because the one on the right on the lower corner is a particular kind of bee I've spotted right near our uh, UC Berkeley campus. It's the Hapropoda depressa. Um, and that's a species of digger bee that resided in a soil plot right near Sather Gate. Um, and it, I was fascinated because in such an urban environment like we have in Berkeley, we can still find these small little alcoves of native plant and bee diversity. We'll move to the sweat bee, which we've seen as the bright green metallic sweat bee on the left. Very common visitors to asters, um, sunflowers, and other flowers in the family Asteraceae. So I'd recommend for y'all, if you do wish to attract more species of bees, that asters are a particularly good flower species of choice. Um, things like daisies as well. Anything that has this very, you know, uh, primitive but very easily accessible flower like the California coast aster. And I see a question, is it possible to spot a digger bee nest entrance? Well, sometimes they're, they're hard to spot, but they may just look like a very, you know, small little round hole. Um, and you might not be sure if it's from a snake or a wasp nest perhaps, or even yellow jackets. But the difference is, is that you need bare plots of soil and they can be filled with, you know, have some sand, maybe a little bit of clay, but they're typically a much more unique than a yellow jacket nest or other kinds of soil dwelling insects. Um, you would tell, you can, if you stood outside for an hour or two and you looked at who goes to that weird hole, you can probably tell immediately whether it's a yellow jacket or some other kind of critter but if it's a bee, you know, they'll, you'll be able to tell. It'll look different. Um, these are small, small bees and, and other kinds of insects. And here, uh, the spectrum of social organization I've done um, kind of helps lay out where some of these other bee species reside on our spectrum. Um, with honeybees at the far right, the digger bees somewhere in the middle, and the bumblebees, not quite as social as the honeybee, but very close. Of course, there are a number of different kinds of bee-friendly flowers and plants. And I hope that in the future, um, you'll either have the opportunity to hear a presentation about these plants um, or that we'll be able to offer some recommendations as well. Um, but I won't go into much detail for now. 
But this is the important part. What can you do and how can you help? So there are a number of resources from places like the Xerxes Society, the California Native Plant Society that offer some very valuable resources on common kinds of bee-friendly flowers. And this one is a nice brochure that I've typically used for our class students and to distribute to volunteers um, that outlines some of the kinds of California native flowers and when they bloom and their water use. Now, you can actually download this yourself online. And if we meet in person, uh, we'll be able to um, distribute these as well. So once I close my slideshow, I'll, I'll put this link in the chat for you to access yourself. And it's called Pollinator Plants of California. And it outlines some of the most important fall blooming flowers, like I've said, the California aster on the left, um, and another species of native plant called goldenrod. Um, and of course, when planting native flowers, you all have more experience than probably I ever do. <laughs> but they may not look as, as pretty at, as other ornamentals during um, the winter time or even the summertime if they go dormant. So hopefully that will offer some really valuable um, information. Okay, so CalFlora, CalScape are great resources for um, learning which kinds of plants you can plant to help attract native bees. And this is going to take me now to our current projects for the Bee Campus and Bee City USA movement. So here on the left, we help restore a garden on campus uh, with a team of students, and we put in a little pollinator garden sign. Um, there's some California poppies, as you see in the front, and we just did some weeding and replanting of flowers like epilobium, which is the California fuchsia, ceanothus, which was mentioned earlier, and some flannel bushes, Fremont and Dendron. But there are many other garden sites that we've helped with um, the help of the City of Berkeley Parks Department to adopt. And here's a map of our, um, of our city. And I'll try to show you here. This is the campus. The UC Berkeley campus is um, located to the east side. And it's kind of a, a rectangle or square shape. There were two gardens we've helped on on campus, but the city gardens include Ohlone Park, Strawberry Creek Park, San Pablo Park, George Florence Park over here, and James Kenny Park, which I believe is in this area. And there are a couple little school gardens we've helped at that could still use some assistance. So if you like to go out and garden, and you want to help us um, on these volunteer restoration events, I'd be more than happy to find a place that we could use um, some extra help. And that may be close to even where you live. And just to, uh, yeah, just to go briefly into it, um, the city of Berkeley has its resources are stretched. Uh, as you may know, you know, money is tight and financial and uh, labor resources are really limited. So our Berkeley Parks Department had 64 employees for the entire city, all the parks, all those little green spots. And that was reduced to 46 in 2016. And there just is not enough time for the employees of the Parks Department to help install, maintain, and water uh, pollinator plantings. But that doesn't mean we can't do that, we can't stop. That's where we've helped partner with our residents, our community volunteers, um, us students with our time during class, uh, free from class, to um, aid in the planting, aid in the weeding events, aid in, in watering, and it's made a very big difference. Here, for instance, is a small little planting of uh, yarrow and native grasses that we've helped maintain as well. So again, Strawberry Creek Park, San Pablo, and Ohlone Parkway, just three spots plus George Florence um, that we've helped adopt with the community member. And it's all to help us move towards this movement where we're restoring nature um, one garden at a time. So 
while native plants are a valuable source of nectar and pollen for our bees, there are certain species of um, ornamental non-native flowers that can also attract and sustain bees and butterflies. But we have to choose those carefully. Otherwise, we may be planting things that will not help sustain pollinators. And that brings me back to that initial question. If you only had one food to eat in your entire life, what would it be? Because if we change our landscapes to where there isn't any food left for our pollinators and our bees, they may be stuck with only choosing limited numbers of plants to forage from. And as you imagine, that nutritional value is extremely low. It'd be like eating a pe peanut butter sandwich every day for the rest of your life. So hopefully that'll inspire you to um, look into this, um, help, hopefully look into some of the resources I'm gonna post in the chat. And maybe you can help in, in some of these gardens on campus or in the city. And here are some bee houses. Um, I'll put those possibly in the chat or in another document for you to explore. And ways that you can help donate to the UC Berkeley Urban Bee Lab, which is a major source of the information and fact sheets and a wonderful little resource to help identify bees in your own yard or garden, this um, Common Bees of California Gardens flipbook. And you can purchase these on um, the UC a &R website. I'll put that in the chat later as well. Um, but these are really handy little handbooks that you can use from helpabee.org and the direct link I'll put um, after to help you find and identify some of the native bees in your garden. Really valuable resource. I've used this for our class um, as well. So this is a, something I wanted to share with you all as a special tool for um, identification. All right, that brings me to the end. Um, so let me, yeah, let's hand it off to Martha and Laundry if there's any other anything I didn't talk about. Thank you, Taylor, very much. This was really, really a deep dive into bees, and I'm really, really thrilled with your presentation. Thanks again. Taylor, you have done an amazing uh, amount of work for a person who's still a student. <laughs> I don't, mm -hmm. you know, your classwork, um, thank goodness, I think dovetails into some of what you've been talking about, because otherwise, how would you have time to go to school? So um, thank you for everything you've done for the city of Berkeley and for the campus mm -hmm. and um, we'll continue to do, I'm sure. You could move a little north into El Cerrito, yeah. you know, and do some yeah. things for us. That would be great. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for Taylor? I know some things have come up in the chat, but he's answered some of them already. Any, any other question before we let him go? I bet he's got a busy day ahead of him. Pamela? So um, mason bees, they're called mason bees because of the way they construct their nests. What do, do they do other things of a, of a masonry nature? <laughs> yeah, I think you're, you're probably right with saying that the way that they're constructing their nests is, is in a mason style. They collect mud and clay from uh, the environment and some people even make uh, artificial uh, piles of mud or buy them if they worry that in the urban environment, there may not be enough uh, source of mud. Uh, but they do collect that kind of uh, mixture and, and partition the cells of mm -hmm. their brood chamber. Um, so in that fashion, they're called the mason bee. But some people may confuse the mason bee name with the carpenter bee. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about the carpenter bee a little bit? I have one that visits my yard all the time and I'm, he's, you know, really wonderful. He's so big and black and shiny. Yeah, and, and some of those are the most popular visitors we might find in our urban gardens. Because the carpenter bees are very large, um, typically black in color, uh, they visit plants like salvia, um, wisteria, very popular, peas, and lupin. Um, and those kinds of bees will uh, 
drill holes in wood or decks or the sides of sheds or even trees. Um, and they are a valuable source of, you know, uh, a pollinator, but surprisingly enough, the carpenter bee isn't a crucial pollinator in a number of other flowers like the asters or buckwheats. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even uh, visit manzanitas, but the bumblebees are often more effective. Interesting. Interesting. Well, um, Taylor, I'm impressed. Uh, you did a lot of work, but mostly I'm impressed in the way that you were able to distill it down to something that, um, you know, fit in our time frame and our, and our, um, you know, I don't know, our, our ability to sit for a while, because we're not yeah. as used to that, I don't think, as, as students are. It, no. it, very nice presentation. <laughs> I, I, I hope I haven't taken up too much too much of the time, but there's there's so much to explore um, with bees. I really do hope to uh, to do more because um, we can't we can't stop with just one part of it. Um, we we find that there's so many other things we could talk about. Like now, what do we do with the California plants? Which ones are the best? Um, so hopefully that'll get you all motivated and and thinking about this. Okay. Fabulous, Taylor. Thank you so much for all your time and your, your wonderful presentation. That was really, that was really excellent. Um, so uh, I think that concludes our meeting, unless anyone has any other Garden Club announcements. Um, just don't forget that we have a board meeting next Thursday. Anyone interested can contact me for the link and uh, work on your plant sale plants. Taylor, we're having a curbside plant sale October 9th. Maybe there'll be some pollinator plants. I bet there will, a bunch of natives. Um, so th thank you again so much. And uh, Taylor, we'll, we'll let you go. And we really appreciate your, your time and your expertise. <laughs> and everybody else, wonderful. Uh, um, <laughs> well, he, he was great. Um, he was so, gosh, young people. It's, ex it's exciting, you know, to see a, a young student who's going to save the world. Yay! <laughs> I'm so glad. So anything else anybody wants to mention or talk about, or I'll let you go. This has been a very long meeting. Um, we were happy to have Lisa and Anne here from the Richmond Garden Club, you were very welcome. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to put this uh, recording on our YouTube channel. I'll figure out how to do that. So um, people who missed it or want to see it again can watch it. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. OK, everybody, work hard on the plant sale. And thank you so much for staying and coming. And uh, you. see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>